is Monday, March 19th, 2018. You're taking a live look at Phoenix, Arizona, where we're expecting plenty of sunshine today, but not as hot a temperatures as we have been seeing lately. And, you know, just due to the fact that uh, winter wants to give us one final little blast here, I am joined by our very own Ron Hoon to talk about the day's biggest stories and news. Ron, how was your weekend? Uh, Pilar was busier than any weekend I've had in a year. <laughs> I am seeing the St. Patrick's Day Parade I Saturday saw that. morning. I love it. Well, you can go to my Instagram page, that's Hooner Fox 10, and I'm like walking practically right along with the bagpipers. Oh, These man. guys and their kilts and the bagpipes playing. I just love it. Awesome. It's fantastic. So, uh, anyway, that parade was uh, happening uh, through the course of the entire morning, went almost two hours there in the downtown Phoenix area, and then in the evening, uh, they do a big uh, event every year out at Falcon Field in Mesa, and I was the MC for that. By the way, I should just mention, I didn't even mention this uh, on Fox 10. We always have a couple more minutes here uh -huh, on Fox 10 Extra. This was a really scary situation. I'm in the middle of emceeing this dinner, and there were over a thousand people for the dinner, and one person had a heart attack. Oh, no. And uh, it was a really serious situation. I was about to start a, uh, a costume contest on the floor. This the, it goes back into the era of the 1940s, because they have all these old World War II era airplanes. Uh -huh. And it is a little bit of an older crowd. And so this uh, elderly gentleman had a full-on heart attack, and there was somebody doing chest compressions on oh, him. No. And I mean, it was a very, of course, we stopped everything all at once, and I was urging people to try to stay out of that area. And then somebody remembered, and this is the point of my story here, somebody remembered that they had installed two defibrillators. Ah, AEDs. Yep. And literally, that made the difference between life and death. Mm -hmm. uh, because I, you could, I could hear the, a person, I believe was a doctor, shout clear, you know, as he had the paddles on the, uh, on the older gentleman. And then it got his heart restarted. Because wow. up until that point, I mean, he was a goner. Wow. And so then the paramedics arrived shortly after that. And a uh, couple of things. I asked everybody in attendance, more than a thousand, I said, these guys, say, these firefighters and paramedics save lives every day, but rarely would they get any type of applause for what they do. It's just part of the job. Mm -hmm. And the place just rang out with applause. Many people stood up to wow. give them a standing ovation. Just the work that they do and the fact that they got there quickly and got this man stabilized and got him off to the hospital was... I mean, it was all the, the whole thing was pretty emotional. Wow, of course. But it's just a good reminder if you hear about efforts at your business or your school or your uh, nearby airport or your governmental building and there aren't any AEDs there yet, these defibrillators. Pass the word along. In this case, I truly believed it saved a man's life on Saturday. But it's night. not just about having them; it's about knowing how to use them. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And people, there, are, there's training that you can go through. The whole, the the key thing is, it was only. I mean, we ran big stories on it mm, within the last few years about put, putting them in some of the major locations here around the valley. You know, uh, and so that effort has been underway, but I had never seen it firsthand where literally a life was hanging in the balance, and thank goodness it all worked out the way it did. Right, right. Yeah. Gonna switch gears So that a was bit. a much longer answer to That's okay. how was your weekend? <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> We're going to travel to Austin, Texas now. Okay. Uh, where there's some Austin, more Texas, explosions Canada, going on, package Town, explosions. Oh, this is, well, yeah, so we had three package explosions, and now we've had a fourth, and it's completely different. And here's what's scary about it. I think that up until... Uh, last night, if you lived in Austin over the course of the last couple of weeks and you had heard, all right, so we had one package bomb go off, and then we had a second, and then we had a third, you could still feel safe enough if you, d if you weren't buying things online and you didn't have a, a package land at your front doorstep, or even if you did and you just didn't want to pick it up, I think you could feel like, well, I'm just not in the, th uh, at the threat level, mm -hmm. you could call it. Well. So what has hap what happened last night escalates it, takes it to a completely different level where now every person in that metro area, frankly, should be uh, operating with extreme caution. This bomber, whoever he or she is, 
set a trip wire and it went off as two guys were walking along the roadway in a quiet Austin neighborhood. Yes, so they're calling this person a serial bomber at this point, and oh, these yeah. have been deadly explosions. Yes, uh, well, we've had two fatalities. We've had a number of other uh, people injured. In last night's case, they were both injured. Uh, the nature of their injuries has not yet been fully revealed, but uh, they both lived. Uh, but it seems like that whoever this bomber is, he just wants to create more mayhem and more fear in that community for whatever reason. And then some other guy, they believe unrelated at this point, actually phoned in a bomb threat to a concert uh, tied into the South by Southwest Festival there in the Austin area. So, well, I'll tell you. I mean, it is, uh, these are some tense days. Though, if there's one silver lining to this latest report of the apparent attack, once again, by the serial bomber, is that uh, they had said in a news conference, which we carried a pretty good chunk of that live this morning about 8 a.m., they're, they're hopeful, they're really hopeful that in this particular neighborhood, there'll be some people who have the surveillance cameras up, mm -hmm. who have some video, and uh, that might be the first thing that helps crack the case. Remember now, uh, so this is happening in Austin, right. Texas. It was in Tampa, Florida, where they had a serial shooter and they started to find some surveillance video mm -hmm. and that helped police really kind of hone in on it. Uh, the police chief this morning did say, we uh, are constantly getting phone tips phoned in. Uh, and we, he, he said, we look at these people's social media. Mm -hmm. It's one of the first things they do. Yes. And they check it out. And so far, he said, after every tip that has come into their hotline, they don't have a good, clear suspect yet. I'll be airing the majority of the news conferences on the you? whole thing from this morning. Yes, okay. here. Great. And also, authorities, uh, they raise the reward for information mm -hmm. uh, up to $50,000 for a total of 115000 for information yeah, right. on who's responsible you here. You know, the thing is, you would surely think that somebody knows something. The thing about it is, so often, and believe me, I'm no uh, criminologist or FBI profiler or anything like that, but so often, especially when it comes to these kinds of situations, there was a serial bombing uh, bomber a generation ago called the Unabomber. Mm -hmm. And this guy was a total loner. And it just seems like so often in cases like this, whoever the individual is, is a loner and doesn't let a lot of people in on his plans. When you get a reward up to $115,000, that might make the difference. But it might not be that one friend who also knows about it. Because mm -hmm. maybe there's one, you know, or maybe there's two. But guys like this, it just seems in the past that they almost like to keep the secret and keep their city on edge until the arrest is made. And they do always, except for one very prominent serial killer case that I can think of over the sweep of time in our country, they do always make an arrest. Mm -hmm. There is one, sadly, that uh, an arrest was never made, and uh, I do believe at this point whoever the, the killer was in this case has probably since died. I don't think they'll ever make an arrest. Chicago. Right. The Tylenol killer. If you're wondering why every time you buy a, uh, uh, a pill bottle, you know, whatever's on it, and you have to peel off that little layer of the film, that little layer of the film or the mm -hmm. aluminum foil or whatever it is, it all relates to um, somewhere, it was right around 1980, 80, 81, 82, right in that time frame, where a serial killer went into some drugstores and tampered with. Uh, these bottles, yeah, these bottles and the pills specifically, and people would take them and they would die. Wow! In Chicago, and they never cracked that case. You can go read up on it. You can Google it. I mean, you can read up on it for hours. But that is the only instance that I can think where we had a serial killer, a number of people die, and they never caught the guy. They even had surveillance video back then. Wow! But they still weren't able. I'm a huge <laughs> proponent. Uh, matter of fact, Pilar, there have been a few times. Uh, that uh, we're on the air and we'll put on some store's grainy video and I'll say, you guys gotta up your game. <laughs> Seriously, there are such high quality cameras now. I completely agree. Even like the little things like you put on your door now for your doorbells, like what are they called? Rings Yes, and stuff? right, like, sure. Even those are higher quality video yes. than what banks have or like yes. stores or, I don't get it. Okay, we're both <laughs> on our soapbox about that one. We'll both get off our soapbox, but it would really, 
Uh, it would really pay, I think, for the future of law enforcement if every business out there uh, had the clearest, most HD type cameras. Uh, and in this case, who knows? Maybe somebody will be going through their video today and come up with that one clue because they need to get this guy caught, captured, prosecuted, and put in prison for the rest of his life. All right, Ron. Well, we're on Fox 10 Extra Live now, but a lot of people don't know that we start the stream an hour before the television show actually starts. Right. So we showed President Trump and First Lady Melania Trump heading to New Hampshire okay. for a talk on opioids. Yes. Uh, all right, so they uh, climbed aboard Air Force One and headed into New Hampshire, and this is really fascinating for two reasons. Number one, uh, it made huge headlines when Rodrigo Duterte, the leader in the Philippines, uh, announced a death penalty for drug dealers there that they wanted to crack down on, and, and it seemed, you know, in our country, we have multiple states where they don't even have a death penalty. Mm -hmm. uh, you can literally commit any crime, the most heinous you can think of, and all you're going to get is life in prison. Uh, but we do have many other states, including Arizona, that has a death penalty, even though it's rarely, rarely used in our state or, frankly, in any state. But uh, Duterte came out and said, we want to have the death penalty for drug traffickers. We believe, the advance word is, that President Trump is going to call for the same thing in this country as a way to crack down on this, particularly the opioid issue, mm -hmm. but heroin dealers, the, the most extreme kind of drug dealers that are, as the president says, by virtue of what they're doing, killing a lot of people. Now, it's an idea uh, to actually see it implemented you know, that's an open question. But that will be a major headline today. There will be a second headline, Pilar, coming out of New Hampshire, and that is that if you want to look at it, this is a very early way for President Trump to go to perhaps the most important state of all 50 when it comes to elections mm -hmm. and to spend some time in New Hampshire. Why? It was just last week that the local senator here in Arizona, which a lot of people wonder if he's going to potentially run for president, Jeff Flake, uh, spoke at an eggs and politics breakfast in New Hampshire. Now there's growing talk that John Kasich, the one-time congressman, the frequent Trump critic, the Ohio governor, is potentially uh, interested in a presidential run in 2020. It's a little different to have an in- uh, an incumbent in office facing challenges within his own party, um, you know, because generally, for example, when Barack Obama uh, was running for re-election back in 2012, the party kind of rallied around him. You would expect to see that for the Republicans this time around. Right now it's looking like it's not happening, and now there are two names floating out there, what with John Kasich's name emerging as well. So the president preemptively going to New Hampshire, uh, to uh, make this speech. Right, but while we're talking about op opioids, really quickly, a uh, statistic. Mm -hmm. uh, opioids, including prescription opioids, heroin, and synthetic drugs such as fentanyl, okay. killed more than 42,000 people in the U.S. in 2016, more than any year on record. That's it's according incredible. to the CDC. It really is incredible. Yeah, and you, if you don't know somebody personally, you don't realize just the extent of it. So. We'll see what they come up with in terms of a long-term plan, but that also was one of the president's campaign pledges early on that he was going to take this issue on. It looks like he's starting to, it was full-throated beginning today. Just really quickly, Ron, before we need to cut to break, uh, McCabe over the weekend. Yep, fired. Firing. Yeah, well, he got fired on Friday night. But, uh, you know, apparently the inspector general inside the FBI had interviewed him, had determined that he was the source of leaks of bureau information to the media, and then was, he's too smart a guy to lie. I mean, I heard Trey Gowdy this weekend saying, hey, look, if you're gonna leak and then you're gonna lie about it, you can expect this kind of a consequence. My understanding, my overall belief is that he's way too smart uh, of anybody who's been in the legal system for that long to quote unquote directly lie about it. But they said that he was, uh, just his answers were very evasive and elusive and it appeared that he was trying to kind of cover up what he had done. So it looks like it cost him big time. All right, Ron, well, thanks again for joining us. Really appreciate it. More news now coming up.